Hello all, welcome back to the NPTEL MOOC on Engineering Hydrology. Today we are going to see the introduction about the well known theorem which is known as Reynolds Transport Theorem. This theorem we will be using for deriving the equations related to movement of water. So, before going to this lecture, let us have a recap of the lecture which we have covered in the previous day. We have seen, we have started with the hydrologic cycle and while going through the hydrologic cycle, we had the flavor of different hydrologic processes such as precipitation, evaporation, evapotranspiration, infiltration and runoff. So, after understanding this cycle, we have seen what is meant by global water budget. After that, we have seen the catchment, what is meant by a catchment, classification of catchments, synonyms for catchments, all these things we have seen because we need to have an area on which these hydrologic processes have been applied. Then we have seen the application of water balance equation in the case of a catchment and also a lake. So, now today what we are going to see the introduction of the Reynolds transport theorem. Let us have a deep look into the theorem. First we will see the basic knowledge or fundamentals required for this theorem that is Reynolds transport theorem. After that we will go for deriving that particular theorem. So, as we all know hydrologic process involves the distribution of water through hydrologic cycle. Different processes are the in all, in all these processes distribution of water is taking place and this varies with respect to space and time. For example, if you are talking about rainfall occurring at a particular location, the same rainfall may not be experienced by the nearby location. So, these processes which we have seen yesterday are evaporation, precipitation, infiltration and runoff. Other processes are the evapotranspiration and uh, condensation all those things we have seen in a general way. So, we will see all these in detail in the coming lectures, but you look at all these processes all these processes are depending on space and time. So, hydrologic process involves the distribution of water with respect to time and space. So, if you are considering a catchment, the movement of water in a catchment is influenced by the physical properties of the catchment. Physical properties in the sense, the catchment will be having certain length, certain width and it will be having an area. So, depending on those physical characteristics of the catchment, there will be changes taking place in the movement of water within that catchment. Whenever we are studying these type of problems related to movement of water, we know that many physical laws are involved in this hydrological processes. So, we need to understand these physical processes in depth, then only we can understand th these processes clearly. So, there is a need to develop models for studying these processes. So, how can we develop models related to these processes? That is next question. So, for, for developing a model related to a particular hydrologic process, we need to have a consistent mechanism. Otherwise, we will not be able to develop the expressions or the representations related to these hydrological processes because you all know that all these processes are very dynamic and complex. So, we need to understand the hydrologic process. Most of the hydrologic processes can be modeled by using the basic laws of physics. So, fundamental laws of physics three basic laws we will be considering when it comes to studies related to hydrological processes. 
those are conservation principles that is conservation of mass, conservation of momentum and conservation of energy. So, conservation of mass is also known as continuity equation, conservation of momentum is known as momentum equation and conservation of energy is the energy equation. So, these are the fundamental equations which we will be using for understanding different hydrologic processes. Next question is how can we derive these equations? So, these are the basic equations which are based on fundamental laws of physics, but how can we derive this equation with respect to hydrologic processes? This can be derived by using Reynolds transport theorem or control volume theorem. Reynolds transport theorem is also known as control volume theorem that you will be coming to know why it is called control volume theorem once you are familiar with the theorem. So, RTT provides a consistent mechanism for developing hydrologic models. RTT is rain, short form of the Reynolds transport theorem. So, RT, once you are clear with Reynolds transport theorem, you will be able to derive these fundamental laws of physics such as this conservation laws, mass, momentum and energy conservation. Now, let us move on to Reynolds transport theorem. So, for studying the movement of fluid, fluid you have already studied in fluid mechanics that fluid can be in the form of liquid and also vapor or in the form of gases. That is it can be either liquid or gas. It can be modeled by using Reynolds transport theorem or control volume theorem. That is movement of fluid we are going to model by using Reynolds transport theorem. We know in the atmosphere water is present in the vapor phase and in the case of surface and subsurface water it is present in the liquid phase. So, when we are talking about movement of water that is it incorporates both the phases vapor phase and also liquid phase. If you are going to model processes related to atmospheric water for example, evaporation it will be something related to the vapor movement. So, movement of fluid I am taking the I am keeping the term general term fluid rather than gases or liquid because fluid represents both vapor and liquid form of water. Before going to the basics of Reynolds transport theorem, we need to know different approaches used for fluid flow problems. These two approaches are Lagrangian approach and Eulerian approach. Let us see one by one. First one is Lagrangian approach and second one is Eulerian approach. In Lagrangian approach what we are doing we are focusing on the entire body of the fluid or solid which we are considering. In the case of solid when we are applying Newton second law or other physical laws applying on a solid body then our main focus is on the motion of the body. We will be giving complete attention to the body that is initially if the body is at this location it will be moving from the initial position to second position then it is reaching third position until it reaches the destination it moves from one location to another. So, what we are doing we are consistently watching the particle from first location to second location third and until it reaches the destination. So, we are closely watching the particle or the solid body as such our main focus is on the motion of the body and the analysis follows the body wherever it moves. The focus on the movement of the particle or group of the particles. You consider the case of a fluid. Fluid consists of large number of particles. 
some of the studies we will be making use of Lagrangian approach in the case of fluid mechanics. But in hydrology perspective, if you are considering the fluid particle and following that particle, it will be not practical. So, for these type of studies what we are doing, we are making an assumption that fluid is forming a continuum. <coughs> that is fluid is considered to form a continuum. And then the focus is not on a particular fluid mass. The focus is then on a control volume, a fixed frame of reference in space through which the fluid passes. That is if you are considering here in this case you can see the fluid particle or the solid body whatever the we are considering that is moving from one location to another our close watches on this body. But if you are talking about the Eulerian approach we will be fluid movement is taking place in this direction. So, for example, if you are considering a flow in a river or any other channel or anything like that. So, you are not following the fluid throughout the entire path instead of that you are considering a frame of reference. So, within this frame of reference this is the frame of reference which you are considering within the frame of reference whatever fluid is entering whatever is going out some amount of fluid is coming inside and at the same time some, am some amount is leaving this frame of reference. We are concentrating or our main focus is on the fluid which is contained within this frame of reference. So, this frame of reference is known as the control volume. So, our main focus is then on a control volume that is the fixed frame of reference in space through which the fluid passes. We are not bothered about the fluid which is present in this location, a fluid which is present before entering the frame of reference and fluid which has left the frame of reference. We are not giving importance to that, but which is contained within this frame of reference we will be giving emphasis. And our analysis will be mainly based on the fluid contained within this region. Okay. So, that is what is Eulerian approach explains to us. So, Lagrangian approach instead of that whatever fluid particle or the body which we are considering our main focus is on that particular body from the initial point to the destination. But in this case it is not like that we are our attention is given our focus is given to the fluid contained within the frame of reference whatever coming inside and leaving. So, what is contained within the control volume we are focusing on that our analysis will be based on that quantity of fluid which is contained within the frame of reference. So, the Reynolds transport theorem is based on the Eulerian approach. Again I am repeating the difference between these two. In the case of Lagrangian approach the focus is on the movement of the particle or group of particles. In the case of Eulerian approach focus is on the moving fluid within the fixed frame of reference. So, here one thing you need to understand for this particular study or for this particular course I am talking about fixed frame of reference. That is this control volume which we are considering for the analysis is fixed in space. But in fluid mechanics when we do analysis related to different problems we can consider moving frame of reference also. Now coming to Reynolds transport theorem. Reynolds transport theorem applies the physical laws to the fluid flowing continuously through a control volume. We have seen what is meant by a control volume. We are not bothered about the outside control volume what is happening. We are concentrating or we are going to apply physical laws to the 
fluid which is contained within the control volume. So, for before going to RTT, we need to have understanding related to fluid properties. Fluid properties can be classified into two different types. One is extensive property and second one is intensive property. Extensive property is denoted by the letter B and intensive property by using the letter beta. Extensive property is the property which depends on the amount of mass of the fluid contained within the fluid. That is, it is dependent on the amount of mass and coming to intensive property, it is independent of the mass of the fluid. So, two properties fluid while we are talking about Reynolds transport theorem, we need to have understanding about the fluid properties. Two classifications or two types of fluid properties which we are talking are the extensive property and intensive property. And what is the difference between these two? One is dependent on the mass of the fluid contained within it and other one is independent of the mass of the fluid. That is the extensive property is dependent on the mass of the fluid and the intensive property is independent of the mass of the fluid. So, what are the examples for this? Mass of the fluid, volume, when you talk about volume, this much of uh, volume is occupied by the fluid. If we are talking about that, definitely it is associated with the mass. There is a relationship with the mass of the fluid. And momentum, what is momentum? Momentum is the product of mass and velocity. So, that is also dependent on the mass. So, the property which depends on the amount of mass present within the fluid, that is the extensive property. Now, coming to intensive property, I have already told you, it is independent of mass of the fluid. What are the examples coming under this? Examples are velocity. Velocity is not depending on the mass of the fluid. Then comes hardness, refractive index, all these things. So, these properties, this extensive property and intensive property can be either vector or scalar. That is the type of property which we are dealing with that. Based on that, we can understand that particular quantity is a vector or scalar. Now, we need to understand the relationship between these two properties. Because one is dependent on mass, the second one is independent of mass. So, there should be a relationship between these extensive and an intensive properties that is B and beta. Let us have a look into that. Let any extensive property, it can be different, we have seen three examples there. So, that way different extensive properties will be there. Generally, we will be denoting the extensive property by the letter B. So, let any extensive property be B and the corresponding intensive property be beta, B and beta. So, what will be the relationship between these two? Relationship is beta is given by dB divided by dF. That is intensive property is the extensive property per unit mass of the flowing fluid. So, this is dB is the extensive property, dM is the unit mass of the flowing fluid. So, beta is defined as the ratio of the extensive property to the unit mass of the flowing fluid. So, beta is given by the expression dB divided by dm. This B and beta can be either scalar or vector. For example, if you consider momentum and velocity are vectors and density is a scalar quantity. So, that when you deal with the property, you will be able to understand this is whether it is extensive property or intensive property, whether it is vector or scalar. For example, if you are considering momentum, momentum is mass into velocity, momentum is something related to 
mass. It is dependent on the mass of the fluid contained within it. So, it is an extensive property at the same time it is a vector. What RTT is doing? Reynolds transport theorem is doing. Why do we want this? Reynolds transport theorem relates the time rate of change of extensive property in the fluid to the external causes producing this change. That is if you are talking about some particular extensive property. For example, if you are talking about mass. So, some changes taking place that is mass is an extensive property. So, due to some action external action if there is some change in just taking place in the mass then what is causing this changes and what is the change taken place. So, RTT is the Reynolds transport theorem relates the time rate of change of extensive property. For example, if it is mass that is dm by dt that change is caused due to some external factor. So, time rate of change of extensive property is related to the external cause which is producing this change. So, if you are talking about time rate of change of extensive property it can be written by using this expression dB by dt. So, this dP by dt needs to be related to the external factor which is causing that change. For an example, if you are considering momentum as the extensive property, momentum is given by the expression mass into velocity. So, if you are writing the time rate of change of momentum dB by dt. So, if you are talking B, if you are considering B as the extensive property, what will be intensive property? Intensive property formula we have already seen extensive property divided by unit mass. So, beta is intensive property beta is equal to dB divided by dm. So, here if you are finding out beta, beta is given by dB by dm that will be equal to if I am writing d m v divided by d m. So, it will be d m v divided by d m that will be v it is nothing but our velocity. So, v is the momentum and beta is given by d b by d m and if you are calculating the intensive property corresponding to extensive property momentum then it will be nothing but our velocity. So, beta is velocity of the fluid that is the intensive property extensive property is the momentum. So, now by Newton second law we all know what is meant by Newton second law if you are making use of that law, we know the time rate of change of momentum is equal to the net force applied on the fluid. Time rate of change of momentum is equal to the net force applied on the fluid. So, time rate of change of momentum here what is the extensive property? Extensive property is the momentum. So, time rate of change of momentum d by dt of mv that is dB by dt is equal to dmv by dt that will be equal to what? So, here we have written the time rate of change of extensive property the, uh, based on Newton second law it is nothing but it is equivalent to net force. So, this net force applied on the fluid is causing the time rate of change of momentum. So, what RTT is doing? RTT is relating the time rate of change of extensive property to the cause behind it. What is creating this change? What is the reason behind this change to take place? So, it is relating the time rate of change of extensive property to that particular cause which is the reason behind it. 
So, that is what we are going to see under RTT by making use of this principle how it can be used for deriving the fundamental laws of physics. Before that we need to derive the expression for Reynolds transport theorem and once we derive the Reynolds transport theorem we can make use of that theorem for deriving the fundamental laws. So, the details related to the basics and the Reynolds transport theorem can be obtained from the textbook by Venti Chow, Applied Hydrology. So, here I am stopping now. Thank you.